Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are finishing up Revelation chapter 19. This is our online Bible study. We're doing this all on YouTube. Uh, originally, we were going to preach this in church through 52 weeks of study, but uh, then the pandemic happened and we thought, maybe this isn't the best time to uh, talk about the end of the world. So <laughs> we moved it over uh, to YouTube uh, because I think there were a lot of people that still wanted to do this because Revelation is just one of those books, right? It's one of those books. We uh, don't read it. We think it's confusing, maybe even a little scared of it, not really sure how to interpret some of the imagery. And so uh, we kind of ignore it. But it is the Word of God, right? This is the Word of God. and We shouldn't be ignoring it. And so each week, we're just taking a little section at a time, maybe 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. And we are finishing up now Revelation 19. This is the rider on the white horse. You might say that in your Bible. We're going to pick it up at verse 10, where we left off. John says, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. Now, this is an angel. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who told to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I think this is uh, important, and I didn't want to skip this, because this is an angel, right? This is an angel, a, a heavenly being, right? Who says, don't worship me. Don't worship me. Don't, don't make pictures about me. Don't pray to me. You should only be worshiping God. We, we shouldn't be praying to other beings. We shouldn't pray to anybody else. We shouldn't worship anybody else, right? Only God deserves our prayers. Only God deserves our worship. That's it. And, and this isn't, this, these aren't my words, right? These aren't my words. This is the Bible. This is an angel himself speaking. Worship God. And it's a good thing he said that. Because if you look over his shoulder, God is on the way right now, right? Here comes Jesus. Verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dripped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this is it, right? This is the moment we've all been waiting for the curtains pull open and there he is the groom jesus himself returning to earth can you imagine i mean can you picture the scene if this is a literal scene right let's just maybe throw out the idea that some of this could be symbolism could be you know wordplay let's just say this is a literal picture how majestic and how massive and mighty would this be right this would be so glorious i mean haven't you always wanted to know what it would be like to see Jesus come down from the clouds, to, to see him return. I mean, it's, it's a special effects Hollywood scene that we've all pictured in our brain. And I, I don't think anyone's going to miss it, right? <laughs> I, I don't think anyone's going to not see this. There's a passage in the Bible where people say, oh, look, here's Jesus. Oh, look, there he is. Like, oh, he came. Oh, look, he came over there. Like, we are not going to miss this. No one's going to have to tell you. <laughs> no one's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, did you hear? Jesus came yesterday. This is, if this scene is literal, big, huge scene, right? And, and if you did see this scene, what would your reaction be? I mean, maybe you might know what your reaction would be if you were a Christian. Let's say you've been a Christian your whole life and you see this. Maybe we could guess what your reaction would be. What would your reaction be if you weren't a Christian? What would your reaction be if you were an atheist or an agnostic? What, what, what would your first 
next action be? What would you do? Would you, would you worship? Or would you shake your fist in defiance? Because you know, when, in, in war, because that's what we've been, we've been describing, right? We have been describing a war. In war, when the king shows up to the battlefield on his horse, that typically means the war is over, <laughs> right? When the king shows up and he's bold enough to walk to the center of the field, it's over, right? It's over. Watch what happens next. Verse 17 says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him, who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Like I said, this is war. This is war. And to see this king return, like, I know how it's going to be for Christians. I know how, we're ex- how excited we will all be to see Jesus and how, how we will worship him, but his enemies? I mean, look at verse 13. It says, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Now, at first you might think, oh, it's, you know, his blood from the cross. No, it's the blood of his enemies. Because it says that right before or right after that in verse 15, it says that uh, he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. Tread the winepress? That's a picture of someone in a winepress with their feet crushing the grapes, dancing on the grapes, holding the skirt, the hemline of their robe up so that it doesn't get wet because the juices from the grapes are splashing. Well, this is the blood of his enemies, crushed. And here in this chapter, uh, this paragraph right here, talking about how everyone who defies Jesus will be slain and how the birds will just devour them. You know, there's a meal before this, which is the great banquet, right? The great banquet in heaven, the wedding feast. Well, this, this is a different, this is a different dinner. And it's God's enemies being devoured by the animals. Look, in all the time that you have here on on earth, there's only one important decision you will ever make. And that's whether you will follow Christ or not. That's it. And I get it. The world has a very strong pull on all of us. It does. We love the things of this world. We love playing in this beautiful playground that God gives us. We love all the fine things that God blesses us with. We love our life and we love our lifestyles, right? But I think we also love doing things our own way. We love putting... God off until Sunday. We love thinking that our ways are correct. We love thinking that we're right, right? (laughs) I listened to an atheist today on YouTube. He had a couple different videos and each one of them said uh, an atheist's best argument, right? And I watched them and I kept waiting for this best argument to show up (laughs) and it didn't happen because uh, this atheist kept talking about logic and reason. And, you know, of course God can't exist. Of course religion can't be true, right? And I thought to myself, how can you possibly think that God can be defined by your logic or your argument, right? I mean, we we like to think that we're so smart and that we know everything 
I, I know me. I am not smart. A lot of times I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. And I also know that I'm broken and that I'm a sinner and that I'm dark. And my puny brain cannot logically put God in a box. It's, it's even hard for me to think about some religious concepts that, you know, they don't make sense. But, you know, it's not my job to figure God out. It's not my job to define God. It's not my job to even argue God's case. My job is to worship. My job is to look forward to the King returning, to make myself ready, to prepare myself as the Bride of Christ, and to look forward to His return. You might have the greatest argument in the world against God or against why you won't become a Christian, but you know what? That argument won't matter when that white horse breaks the atmosphere. Our words won't matter. I am, if you're watching this, I am begging you. I am begging you. Pursue a life of Christ. Look into it. Stop putting this off. Consider this your wake-up call. Stop, stop chasing after your own lust. Stop chasing after your own desires. You've partied long enough You've done things your own way long enough. You've lived that life. You've enjoyed the world. You've enjoyed the things the world gives. It's, it's time to put those things aside and to start listening and loving this God that loves you. Look, and it's not hard. God has done all the heavy lifting for you. I know it seems hard, but God has done it all. And he loves you. And he, he has gone so far as to to put his own son on the cross for you. His own son died for you. Surrender your life. And, and, I would, and I would just throw out, if you're already a Christian, if you're already a believer, that's awesome. Surrender your pride. Find humility. Surrender yourself. Give it up. Give it all to God. You know, Jesus tells the rich young ruler, give it all away. Give everything away. Not just your money. Give your life. Give your whole life to God. Stop worrying about this or this or this. Stop worrying about all these human things, all these human arguments, all these... Stop worrying about politics, okay? Stop worrying about whether this is right or this is wrong or who said this or what. Stop worrying about all this gossipy nonsense. The only thing of any value and any worth in this world is where we stand with God. That's it. And if we're in our right place, then we need to be making sure that other people are right with God. We know we have, we have one mission on this earth, and that's to love God, to worship Him, and to love each other. That's it. If it's not love God, love each other, I don't, I don't care. It needs to be love God, love one another. Always. When the clouds break... And the rider on the white horse enters the atmosphere. It's over. And there's only one choice to make. You'll either bend the knee or you won't. That's why we come to church to worship. And I don't, I don't know if you're self-conscious about worship. I don't know if you can let yourself fully worship. But don't worry about the person on your left or right. Don't worry if they can hear you sing. Don't worry if you have a bad singing voice. Don't worry if the people can't be behind you can't see. If you raise your hands, do what you need to do because you are singing to this being that we just read about. You are worshiping this being that we just read about, right? This is God. This is God. And like the angel said, don't worship anything else. Don't pursue anything else. Don't bow to anything else. Don't pray to anything else. Don't give your life to anything else. Because look right behind you. Here he comes. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.